Thank you. We've made it to the final session, and I am delighted to welcome back Debbie White, Chair of Co-op Group, who's put in a stint and a half today. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, back from last year's uh, Youth Summit, the wonderful uh, Chief Exec of Co-op Foundation, Nick Crofts, and he's also brought from the Young Game Changers Fund, Victor and Maya. Over to you, Debbie. Thank you. So we're going to do a couple of things in this next session. We're going to hear from Nick and our fantastic game changers here, what they've been up to and what's going on. And then I'm going to share a few reflections from the Young People Forum next door. And I'm actually going to go and talk to some of the people who have joined us uh, all day today and to get their reflections and their guidance to us uh, to how we engage all cooperators of whatever age. So I'm going to hand over to Nick, and he will talk a little bit about where we're up to with the Co-op Foundation. Thanks, Nick. Fabulous. Uh, thank you, Debbie. Thank you uh, for the wonderful invitation to come back. This is two years on the trot uh, that I've been booked for the Youth Summit. So obviously I'm doing something right. Uh, as uh, we heard, I'm the chief exec at the Co-op Foundation. We are proud to be uh, the charity of the cooperative group. We are a grant maker and a campaigning organisation and in this last few years we've made £19 million worth of grant awards to community organisations and to charities across all of the nations and regions of the United Kingdom. Perhaps that's why I've been booked two years on the trot, because we come with money at the, uh, at the Co-op Foundation. Uh, we launched our new strategy about 18 months ago, and uh, that strategy had two key components to it. The first one was that we wanted to find a way to meaningfully put our cooperative values and ethos and approach into the way in which we do our grant making. It was really a recognition that philanthropy and cooperation are very different. You can characterize philanthropy as being a handout. You can characterize cooperation as being a hand up. And we wanted to find meaningful and interesting and distinctive ways to bring a cooperative ethos to what we do with our grant making. And for us, that was about giving away power. Uh, the funding sector in the UK, very traditional, very staid, uh, very siloed. Uh, it's uh, only a slight exaggeration to say that the funding sector in the UK is groups of old, straight, white men, the committee, deciding which organisations are worthy, in inverted commas, of receiving support. That did not feel very cooperative to us. So what we wanted to do was to mobilise the voices of young people and people with lived experience to make decisions about all of the aspects of our organisation's work, and particularly who it is that receives our funding. So power, that was the first component of the strategy. And the second component of the strategy was completely radical, both for us as a grant maker, but also more widely for the funding sector, uh, because we wanted to put funding and training and support directly into the hands of individual young people. So that led us to launch the Young Game Changers Fund. Uh, it's a four and a half million pounds, three year uh, funding program designed to put uh, money, but also training, support, advice and guidance directly into the hands of individual young people who've got a brilliant idea to do something amazing in their community. These young people are the activists, campaigners, disruptors, leaders, social entrepreneurs, and of course, cooperators of the future. And the grants are up to £20,000 per year for each individual young person, so a serious amount of money. And of course, what we wanted to do was to marry that approach with the approach about giving away power. So uh, working with our Game Changers delivery partners, the fantastic Global Fund for Children and Restless Development, we built out our youth steering group. 
Uh, and the youth steering group's job was basically to take all of the key decisions about the Game Changers Fund, who would get the money, how it would be distributed across the years, uh, what the application criteria would be, etc., etc. We relied on the lived expertise of young people to take those decisions for us. And before I hand over to some of those young experts, I see the infamous clicker has been dropped next to me, which I think means I've got to do something. There we go. Um, the, uh, we are in the business of recruiting uh, young people for more of this work. So if you've got any interest in working with the Co-op Foundation, and we pay, of course, it's not right that anybody be expected to work without payment. If you've got any interest in working with us, then do please come and find me because we're always looking for more young people to guide the work that we do. So with that, I will hand over to the sensational Victor and Maya. A huge round of applause, please. <laughs> Okay, so what are we and what does this group, um, Stone Group, essentially do? So this, the YGF is this fund made of 13 youth activists from around the UK, and we've got diverse lived experiences, but one shared goal, and this is to empower young people into youth social action. And essentially what we did, as Nick mentioned, we sort of spearheaded the core design of Young Game Changers Fund ensuring specifically that this fund was truly youth-led. So essentially, um, how we went about that, we had to establish a collaborative working relationship because none of us really knew each other. We had to like work together because, um, you know, like Nick said, it is a co it's cooperative. That's what it's all about. Um, so we did that through like various sessions where we developed our knowledge of grant making, philanthropy, governance, and really had like a holistic education about what exactly we're trying to do. Um. Okay, so when we look at the design, so of this design process of the fund, one big thing for us at the start was to clarify our purpose. And this essentially meant what are our core criteria, what do we want the outcomes to be for this fund? And this sort of led to us specifying our parameters and sort of scoping things like timelines and sort of deadlines and restrictions, but also allowed us and sort of got us to think about establishing questions for the application, which was quite a big part of the design process. And essentially got us thinking, what are the things that we're looking for from the grantees, what are the things we're looking for from the young people which want to bring this change from their communities? And finally, essentially, the question was, how are we ensuring as a steering group that we are empowering youth social action in the UK. Um, obviously, once we've designed the fund, we have to allocate the funding. Um, so we did that using the parameters that we set out initially, using group guidelines, using two residentials and multiple ses weekly sessions, um, rounds of um, application reviews, um, using the Evaluator software to narrow down application pool size. Then we have to review our guidelines, you know, understand our unconscious and conscious bias, because that's a massive thing in philanthropy and grant making. Um, and we had to communicate our chosen application. It was very much a collective decision. Each application and each, you know, funding decision was a collective decision. Um, and then essentially, like, we had to work out which, you know, um, which grantee, which application would truly be youth-led, which truly would create a legacy of community involvement, which truly grassroots-led, that's truly just going to, you know, empower everybody a part of it. Um, so, essentially, some, a few like, stats and figures, and we have some two case studies that we're going to share a bit afterwards. But we funded over 30 young game changers across the UK, include, um, including organisations and individuals, in all four countries on various topics. So, um, you can see a few here. And we just have two case studies to share with you quickly. Um, one of our first case studies is um, Tess Howard, who, fun who founded Inclusive Sportswear. Um, and Tess Howard is a Team GB hockey player and Commonwealth um, Gold medalist. And her organisation is all about everybody belongs in sportswear. It's all about inclusive sportswear. It's about having sportswear that's not hyper-feminine, that, that restricts movement. It's all about everybody deserves to be in sportswear. And the funding will enable the production of kits and an online um, learning platform and building like a community of like-minded sports individuals. Cool. And the second one is essentially Fungal CIC, which is led by um, this wonderful young person called Thomas. And 
This sort of initiative is quite fascinating, at least when I found it really fascinating, which essentially involves using mushroom cultivation and repurposing urban waste into nutrition. Um, absolutely fascinating idea, right? And this sort of project aims to create this a flagship farm where it looks at increasing the capacity to transform water sustainability. And you have things like biomeditation, um, absolutely fascinating concepts. Um, of course, you have community fees, sustainable youth workshops, and the idea of contributing to a more resilient and interconnected community. And I think that is essentially what a lot of the projects which we funded are about. It's not just about the individual person, it's about really bringing the communities together. And that's why um, you see things led by young people for young people work so well. Cool, and so, um, so this is our, why youth-led decision-making is important, which I will leave this slide for you guys to digest for a couple seconds, um, which essentially youth leadership, leveraging your experiences, and all things like this, which essentially us are the student group thing, which is very important for youth-led decision-making. So. That's, that's brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much. So, I mean, you have to say, this is a phenomenal enterprise that led, led by, and I know other young people, but I am going to ask them some questions, but let's just give them a round of applause for sharing what they shared. So, so I've got a few questions, and I'm afraid the first question, this is not really very fair of me, but the first question isn't actually one that I've shared with these guys. So I'm just going to ask you, because, you know, uh, you've been on a journey yourselves personally as well as, as part of this. So what, what would be your biggest learnings from having been involved in something like this? I think one big, very big thing for me is how diverse perspectives with the Come Across Diverse at Start are so powerful. Mm -hmm. And in our steering group, there's been, I've learned a lot and I really think and talk about this two-way flow of sort of value where I feel like I give value as a young person with my experiences, but also gain so much value from my peers, so much value from the projects which I even read about. And I think this exchange of values by incredibly different perspective, merging together into one common goal is what very big thing, which I think is quite key in this case. That's lovely, thank you. I think for me, um, I don't know, I would say maybe just the, how complicated the whole process is, that sounds bad, but it's also a good thing, like it's so complex, change making and power shifting, and it's got all these different components, and I think it's kind of beautiful to see it all come together, and learning like, like each different thing that could come together and make a difference, it, like we said before, it's a collective effort, you know, like it's all about bringing every single thing, and I think it's just having that exposure to each part of change making. Yeah, I think that's yes. been like the biggest learning journey for me. Yeah, so there isn't just one magic one, basically, is what you're saying. There's actually got to be lots of different components yeah. that, that come together. So, how did you feel about being involved in a, a youth led design process? What were your initial reactions when, uh, when, when this was kicked off? I mean, I think um, I kind of talked about that idea of two values or flowing of value. Um, I think it was quite empowering, it's quite inspiring, quite reassuring that we have actually projects, things like this actually beginning to take place. Um, if I kind of humble in as well, I'll say, I mean, of course you have things like imposter syndrome sometimes, I've got 4.5 million out the back of my shoulders. Um, and essentially, sometimes the passion of certain young people sort of relies on my decision. And that's quite a bit of pressure, but I think it's also quite um, sort of rewarding to be able to actually be able be in a position to impact young people in such a great way and being able to essentially impact um, youth voice in the whole country um, mm -hmm. at this level as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'd echo Victor. I think imposter syndrome is a thing that I also experienced, you know, having that pressure and feeling like, who am I to make them decisions? Mm -hmm. You know, who am I as a young person to say, oh, they should get funding, they shouldn't get funding. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I think as a whole, like, it's been so empowering, like Victor said, like, I feel seen, I feel like my lived experience you know, it's listened to, not just, okay, it's there, it's not tokenistic, it's not performative. It's like my, my words, my experiences, everything that I've, all the knowledge that I bring to the table is taken into account and yeah. it's used. Yeah. And I think that's so empowering. I know it's all about empowerment and power shifting, but it really just makes you feel appreciated. It makes you feel yeah. valued, makes you feel trusted. And yeah, I just think it's amazing like that we have this opportunity. Um, and I think also just 
like you know game changers fun it's a it's a continuous process yeah. it's so innovative like that's one thing that like, we love about it like we had this conversation before like it's constantly changing. We constantly bring in learning development in. Mm -hmm. um, next week we have a um, residential where we're going to, yeah, um, we're going to in integrate some of the um, learning development we've had from the first funding round in, yeah. um, and then talk about you know our, se our second funding round, bringing in new members of the steering group. And I think like Nick said before, if anyone's you know interested in it, we've got this QR code there, or just meet for Nick. Um, but yeah. Honestly, I think it's amazing. Mm. And, and to what do you think uh, the impact it's had on you is because you've designed it? Mm. I would say so, I definitely. I think the fact that we were sort of the pillars of this fund, um, to quite, quite a big degree, was one of the big factors which really impacted me, I say. Um, the fact that we're not just sort of a component or a consultation, but actually the pillars and the building blocks of the fund, I think quite that's yeah, very big impact on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so maybe in summary, how do you think Young Game Chambers Fund is challenging philanthropy and grant making in the UK? How, how do you think it's changing the landscape? Do you think it's changing the landscape? I mean, as Nick said, traditionally in the UK, philanthropy is very top down, it's very traditional. It, there's almost a white saviorism complex. There is a white saviorism complex. It's all based on donor agendas. Not really. It's not about community needs, and that's what YGF is literally challenging. Mm. Like it's um, you know it's young people. It's youth led. It's community. It's grassroots led. It's you know it's It's got community engagement. It's about inclusivity. It's about innovation. It's about change. It's about constant development, and it's about the people who it's going to. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, like, what else can you say? I mean, I think this youth-centered approach, which I found really found fascinating, you often have sort of that call of, like, young people, not just the present, but the driving force of the future, right? And the fact that this is so youth-centered means that not only we are sort of supporting young people um, at the current stage, but we're also building sort of young leaders as well, right? And putting young people in that, or giving the opportunities to young people to actually build themselves. And I personally, as I mentioned, I feel like I've grown a lot as a young person. I mean, I've learned a lot and gained so much experience, but much more, I feel like I've become more of a person which I try to represent, of the people, the young people which I try to represent, and that sort of desire to improve myself is always something which I feel like is important, just not for me, but also for all the young people which I sort of represent in these spaces as well. Yeah, I think like Nick, sorry, I think like um, Nick said, he said, you know, philanthropy typically it's a handout. YGF mm -hmm. is a hand, is, it's a hand up, it really is. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's part of free grant making, like we as young people are making a fund for young people. Yeah, it's, you know, we have that knowledge exchange and like Nick just said, we also got a lot out of it. Like, and YGF, you know, it's not just financial support, obviously that's a massive part, but it's also holistic. We give mm. like support offers, we have mentoring, people get connected to networks. You know, it's all about bringing people together, giving people a platform, you know, and just letting them shine. It's like age shouldn't be a barrier to agency. Mm -hmm. And literally that's what the fund is all about. Yeah. I think we have to say these two young people are awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, In incredibly inspirational and I can see that the passion and enthusiasm you've got but also the care that you're, that you're bringing so thank you so I'm going to turn now to uh, some young people who were in the uh, forum in the other room uh, that I uh, although I'm not under 30 I was actually allowed to go and participate in and I thought first of all I'd sort of give you um, some of my reflections from actually what I saw and heard uh, on the other side on the other side of the wall and um, we talked about all sorts of subjects, but I'm just going to give you a couple of the themes that I felt came through. One thing that came through really strongly from the people who participated uh, in the Young People Forum is this need for a collective vision. And I thought that really resonated with me because we've got to be clear what it is we want to try and accomplish. And you know, quite a few people talked about understanding what their goal was and actually understanding the goal and having that collective vision got them through the challenging period, you know, there's difficulties, etc. I think the second thing, which I'm sorry, Rose, I'm going to just put on your plate, I'm afraid, is, um, is education. Uh, you know, how do we educate about what cooperation and collaboration is all about and, and how it is such a powerful alternative business model. And I think, 
You know, that came through, I think, in almost every conversation that we had next door, the full conversations that we had, the, the need for education. And then, you know, I think the final thing I'll say is um, a really clear message about how empowering the people who were uh, next door felt that the nature of working in a cooperative, cooperative way was. It was empowering to everybody and, and not just to a small few or, or, or a single person. So a fabulous, fabulous set of conversations. Uh, I think we took a little bit of time to warm up in the morning. It was all a bit like, you know, it's like, it's like sort of, a, you know, first day at school sort of a feeling, but we got straight into it, I think, uh, in, in the second round. So I'm now going to come and talk to some of the young people who... Uh, were very kind to sort of uh, join in with us today. And um, uh, I feel I've got more responsibility than Rory has here. So uh, the first person I'm going to introduce you to is Rory Scriven. And he is 17 years old. My God, well, you know, you're doing an amazing <laughs> job. You haven't even spoken. but uh, And he is the CEO of a charity called young uh, change makers. So um, we would really love to know why did you set up the charity and what is its ambitions? Over to you. Yeah, so uh, I've been involved in all sorts of social action from social mobility to children's social care over the past five years. And that all really started because I was frustrated that young people are being listened to, mm -hmm. especially uh, growing up in care, a system that's all about listening to young people, our voices, were in the background. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, I'm starting Young Change Makers to make sure that we have more young people on charity trustee boards, uh, becoming school governors, becoming magistrates, and we'll do that through intensive mentoring programs. So uh, we'll give each young person a mentor that's a board recruiter mm -hmm. and currently a trustee. Yeah. And then we'll also do leadership training as well and hopefully have a, a small pot of funding uh, mm -hmm. as well for that young person in, in personal development. Um, so, yeah, really passionate about social mobility uh, mm -hmm. coming from a background where there's lots of barriers. Yeah. Yeah. But for me, I think we've got a really big diversity issue with charity trustee boards. Like Nick was saying earlier, uh, the funding sector is really traditional and so are trustee boards. I'm actually going to challenge Nick as well. Uh, that's, that's making him very nervous now. Uh, about seeing if the foundation can do some work to champion younger trustees on boards as well as, 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 well as the, uh, the foundation's own board as well. Because it's so important that we reflect and serve the communities that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm quite lucky as well. I'm, I'm a trustee for uh, an arts charity mm -hmm. uh, in London. And uh, my, my employer, who uh, is also a consumer co-op, are really, really supportive of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's for a few reasons. Mm -hmm. Because trusteeship and civic engagement has so many benefits on all sides. For co-ops, it's uh, young people and their employees are really rooted in the community. And it's really cost-effective personal development too. But for young people, it can be an absolute life-changing experience. Learn about governance, learn about the charity sector, learn about how our court and justice system works and being empowered by that. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's why I, I do it. I know I've gone off it on a, a bit of a tangent there. <laughs> no, 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 brilliant. No, no. I think, uh, I mean, I would totally agree with you, Rory, actually. And it's one thing that when people come to talk to me about uh, uh, how do they expand their influence, how do they uh, grow in their own personal development, that I absolutely say, actually, joining some sort of trustee board or a school board or, you know, in your local community, even more, you know, the better. It's a fantastic way actually to grow your skill base and actually to learn and connect with different types of people so that's that's absolutely fantastic thank you rory for uh, your answer and i'm now going to move over <laughs> to uh, alaya um and uh alaya is a, a youth voice ambassador and i think um what we'd really love to hear from her is how do we listen better and engage better with young people as, as cooperators. So the floor is yours. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Elia. Um, I first want to start, and forgive me for doing this, I want to first and say and challenge this statement that you have on the board, giving youth a voice. Uh, me and Rory, we were talking about it. Um, it's not about giving youth a voice because young people already have a voice. Have a voice. Yeah. It's more... <laughs> 
it's more about amplifying their voices and giving them a platform to be heard. Mm -hmm. Um, could you repeat your question again? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just really so, can you uh, give us some advice on how we engage with young people better, and uh, and particularly about how we listen to them and, and get and get engagement from them as cooperators? All right. Um, so, I've been in youth empowerment and been doing youth voice for about five years now, and I actually want to answer this question by telling you my story. Absolutely. Um, so I first started off with Youth Voice by discovering my voice and um, what some organisations that I volunteered with did is that they gave me the platform for my voice to be heard. You know, I had a passion to be able to raise cultural awareness in predominantly white areas and um, the way that they did that was they incentivized us. So they gave us the opportunity to have travel bursaries, they gave us the opportunity to be able to upskill ourselves. So I gained a lot of public speaking skills. I gained a lot of communication skills and how to talk to different people because it's a, it's a skill that a lot of young people still need to learn. Mm. Um, and predominantly, I'm going to categorize it in three things. It's about seeing them. It's about hearing them. And it's also about taking action yeah. with what they're saying. Because I feel like I want to talk about the tokenistic approach that a lot of organizations have. And it's so unfortunate that I have to talk about it because a lot of organizations do do this. And I really want the cooperatives to not do it. Um, so I will say that the way that organizations tokenize young people is by just hearing their voice but not taking the action. Mm. I think a lot of organizations really miss out that third step. Mm of taking action and doing something with what they've said. Mm. You can have your round table, you can have your surveying, but what are you actually doing mm. with my voice? Mm -hmm. I think that's a fantastic message. Thank you very, very, very much. So, yeah. yeah. I think, I think you raise a really good point about how, what can we do to enable and support people finding their voice. That is a really powerful message, actually, because uh, I, I totally understand you. You don't always know where your voice is. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and now I'm going to move on to Arla, who uh, was, on, was also on, on one of our panels. Uh, she's from the Cooperative uh, Bank Scheme. And we're, we're going to ask Arla about um, what's it like working within a cooperative uh, particularly one that's well known for its ethics, and, and how does it make you feel empowered as a young person? Yeah, so I would say that um, earlier I mentioned that we put ethics at the heart of everything that we do. What I meant by that was within our work culture, within our kind of everyday decision making, we take everything back to consumer duty and we take everything back to our ESG proposition, making sure that, you know, nothing kind of goes out of line within that. And sometimes, you know, we think about great ideas, but even if a percentage, a tiny small percentage of that um, would potentially not benefit the customer in the best way, we have to kind of scrap that away and kind of think of new ideas. Um, I would say, and it's really reflected um, within the culture of the bank, I feel like the bank has um, attracted like-minded people over the years and you know I can I can honestly say that the senior people at the bank that I work with really care about us as graduates and they really care about our progression within the bank when we started you know they and they still say to us um, that we're the future of the bank mm. and they really want to invest in us and you know it's um, so our graduate scheme is very much um, structured but it's also based on what we're interested in and I feel like what you mentioned about amplifying our voices you know um, I, I would like something more maybe financial so the bank has offered to support that in the future for me and I feel like I am being listened to and I am a valued member of uh, staff and I'm as the future of the bank I feel like I can add more value mm -hmm. and because they're investing in me mm -hmm. I can invest back to back into the yeah. bank yeah absolutely thank you thank you very much Arla. that's uh, uh, I, and, and I know one of the reasons Arla joined the Crofty Bank, because she shared it earlier, was because of the ethics and the different decision-making that, uh, that, that, that the bank has. So 
Um, last but no means least, uh, I've come to Jasmine Gardozzi, who is the Birmingham Poet Laureate. I've never met a Poet Laureate, so I feel very honoured, uh, Jasmine, to meet you. Um, and as I understand your role, uh, it comes with quite a lot of responsibility to inspire and engage young people across the Birmingham region. So I'm really interested to hear that, how that's going and, and what learnings would you share with us here today? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm very, very lucky that, um, you know, I have the other people around the table who've just spoken to bounce off of and say, um, how is it going? Is, uh, it's case, uh, what they've said um, about giving young people a voice versus young people already having a voice. Yeah. Uh, that's so true and I see it every day. Uh, I work in the poetry community uh, and I have done for 10 plus years. Um, everything is DIY. Everything is grassroots and it's done by young people. We're talking um, university level upwards. Uh, the reason why I am Birmingham Poet Laureate and I became Birmingham Poet Laureate uh, by the time I was 30, it's because of all of the open mic nights and the uh, individual um, events and small collectives and organizations which are happening by bright, uh, were organized by bright, vibrant young people who come from this city. And uh, it's kind of not a secret that Birmingham used to be the youngest city in Europe. It still is one of the youngest, um, and it is also super diverse. Uh, that's not uh, just a superlative term, it's literally, the literal technical term, according to the census data, a super diverse city. Um, so we are world leaders in showing what young people from a variety of intersections can do. And the case studies are in, the results are in, we can say that we are awesome. Um, and when left, when given tools, when given empowerment, when given a bit of space, we change a lot um, and it is through our own resources, by coming together, by collecting in communities that I have seen the difference that we make to our city. Yeah. Brilliant. Round of applause for, for Jasmine. So, so I'd like to wrap up by saying there's some really important messages from our young people here today and, and from our, our, our game changers. And it's incumbent on all of us actually to take them away and work out what we're gonna do differently in the next year. Uh, at this point, thank you for listening to me. I'm gonna hand back to Rose to round us off. Thank you, Rose.